Hey guys, thanks for joining us for this 95th episode in Season 2 of Good Questions with Cameron Dole. Our special guest for this episode is our good friend Meathead Goldwyn. We'll be talking about 4th of July and Juneteenth grilling ideas. We'll also feature ribs, and we'll also talk about him being a 2021 inductee into the Barbecue Hall of Fame. If you would, please take the time to subscribe, comment, leave some feedback, check out the shop, and of course share with your friends. Now we try not to be too judgmental, but what is something stupid that you secretly judge other people for? Well, here are a few good ones that people have mentioned. Number one, when someone forgets your name or keeps using the wrong name. Number two, people who use their speakerphone in public or play music out loud. Number three, when someone's rude to a waiter or any fast food worker. Number four, oversharing on social media, like putting every tiny problem in your life on blast. Number five, how someone's kids behave or don't behave. Someone said it's annoying when parents act like their kids' temper tantrums are cute. Number six, people who gossip, especially since they're probably gossiping about you too. Number seven, people who leave their shopping cart in the middle of the parking lot. Number eight, when the bathroom in someone's home is really gross. Number nine, when someone says, I don't like animals. Not wanting a pet is fine, but not liking animals in general, that's different. And number 10, when you put your turn signal on and someone in the next lane speeds up to block you from merging. We'll be back with our good friend Meathead Goldwyn right after this. Our good friend, uh, grill man extraordinaire, Meathead Goldwyn with us. And first off, Meathead, always good to see you, my friend. Always good to talk to you, too. Uh, we're in barbecue season now, aren't we? <laughs> we are We are well into barbecue season and uh, well into summer here in, in Oklahoma, that's for sure as well. Uh, I, you you feel in the summer, the summer heat up in Chicago area? Yes, we are. We've had uh, about two weeks now in the uh, 90s, so that's a... Uh, little early even for us to have it, but the garden is booming, and uh, uh, we've been having uh, uh, homegrown salads and uh, BLTs with lettuce from the backyard, so it's uh, it's summer. Hallelujah. <laughs> now, summer, obviously, we get close to the 4th of July, and uh, there, there's certain meats that go with certain holidays, and uh, you mentioned this before we came on. Fourth of July, everybody thinks thinks ribs, and uh, I think that's probably oh, yeah. a good I thing. Mean, Thanksgiving's to- turkey, and Fourth of July is ribs. Also, Juneteenth just around the corner, um, and uh, we should you know we should touch base on that because uh, um, Juneteenth is uh, uh, officially barbecue. I mean, it's almost always celebrated with barbecue, and uh, the the, um, uh, the celebration calls for red. Um, uh, usually it's a red drink, um, uh, red barbecue sauce on ribs and, uh, watermelon and, uh, red velvet cake. So f- red food. So ribs is the call for the season. Now I, I didn't, I usually don't throw myself out there like this meathead, yeah. but you asked me if I would fess up to something I've, I have never done ribs on the grill and uh you know i i can talk a good grill game but I, i've never done ribs can you believe that i can't and i don't think i can talk to you anymore <laughs> yeah, <I know>. <laughs> <laughs> all right well let, let's let's get you there um I, I happen to know since we've been talking for a long time um that uh your main machine is a four burner gas grill yes sir um and you don't need a smoker to do ribs um y- it's nice to have one um, but you can do um, ribs on a gas grill. And let's talk about how to do that, because I know there's a lot of folks out there like you who would like to get ribs right. Um, so the, 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 the important thing for ribs is, is you can't cook them too hot. They're, um, uh, the, 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 this, the rib cage of a hog is like your rib cage. It's holding in all the internal organs, but it's also got um, 
some hardworking muscles in between the rib bones. Right. And, um, and there's a lot of connective tissue that holds those rib bones together. And if you cook them hot, um, the proteins shrink, the muscle fibers shrink, and it squeezes out the juices. But if you cook them low and slow, that connective tissue can gelatinize. It can get very soft and succulent. Um, so the key here is, is to keep the temperature down. I like to shoot for around 225, but it's hard to do on a gas grill because the thermometer on a gas grill is in the dome and it's centered right. in the middle there. So you're going to have to just eyeball it. Now, if you can get a, a thermometer with a probe that's on a rope, um, you can set that on anywhere you want on the grill surface um, and that'll help. But w- we can eyeball it here. So what you're going to do is, is you're going to set up the grill in two zones. And this is a good habit to get into almost for anything, whether it's Mm -hmm. steaks, ribs. You're going to have one side of your grill where both burners are on and one side of the grill where both burners are off. If you've got a three burner grill, you'll either turn one burner on or two burners but leave one burner or two burners off. And it depends on, you know, uh, what your temperature control is like. And um, in general, I think on a two burner grill, you'll probably turn two burners on around medium to medium high and leave the other two burners off. And there's just three of you in your household. So you're going to do two slabs of ribs. For most folks, half a slab is enough. Um, So you may have a little extra or if you're really hungry, You'll, you'll gobble down two slabs. <laughs> so you're going to put two slabs of ribs. Um, you're going to, um, uh, if you want, you can peel off the membrane that's on the backside of the ribs. It can get a little tough. It can get a little rubbery. You don't have to. A lot of restaurants don't bother. Um, it's a gesture that makes eating a little easier. Right. Um, getting the membranes off is a little tricky. You got to use like a butter knife and slide it under the membrane. And then you grab it with a paper towel and you kind of peel it off. And it sometimes tears. It's a bit of a pain. If you go to AmazingRibs.com, I've got step-by-step photographs <laughs> and even a video of how to do this, but you don't have to peel off the the membrane, but you do want to put a spice rub down Um, and you can buy spice rubs in the stores. Um, uh, Go for a pork rub. Pork rubs usually have a little paprika, a little Mm -hmm. onion, a little garlic, some sugar, pork and sugar work together nicely. Um, And uh, you don't have to get too crazy, too fancy. You can mix up your own salt um, and uh, you, you, you sprinkle it on, give a good coat. And um, you put the ribs on the indirect side, the side where the burners are off. So what's going to happen is, is they're going to gently roast with airflow. It's convection air. You don't have any heat directly underneath it. So it's going to be cool over there. It's going to hopefully be around 225 to 275. And that's a nice temperature range where you won't burn the ribs and you won't shrink those connective tissues and the proteins. And um, uh, if you want, you can take a chunk of hardwood. Chunks are better than um, chips. And you're going to throw the chunk of hardwood under the grate right on top of the burners. Now, most gas grills have like a little um, uh, uh, metal V-shaped thing or plate that protects the burner from dripping fat and grease. And you can put it right on top of the uh, that, 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 that deflector plate. And it'll smolder. Um, Actually, you want it to catch on fire. So you might want to crank it up all the way so it'll catch on fire. You want it to burn. Mm -hmm. um, And then you can turn it back down. Um, You want it to burn. And and when it burns, it makes the best tasting smoke, not smoldering. A lot of people think they got to have a big billowing clouds of white smoke. But burning it actually makes a better tasting smoke. Now, if you've got baby backs, they'll take three to four hours that that long. Um, If you've got spare ribs or what they call St. Louis cut, which is a subsection of the spare ribs, um, they can take five to six hours and you'll know they're done. You'll pick them up in the middle with your tongues and you kind of bounce them. And if the surface cracks, you're there. Um, And uh, usually I recommend people use a thermometer. And if you've got a good digital probe, you want to shoot for around 190 to 205 degrees in that range. Um, and that should give you a really tender, juicy, succulent rib uh, that connective tissue dissolves. And you've got ribs that will be better than what you get at most restaurants 
because they'll cook their ribs because they take so long. They'll start the ribs early in the morning. And often they're holding them for hours mm, and mm. they're really best if you pull them off fresh. Now, if you want sauce and not everybody does, if your meat's really cooked well and it's a good rub, you may not want sauce. Right. You may want to go, um, go, go naked. Fourth um, <laughs> <laughs> of July tradition. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, but if you, if you want sauce, you wait till they're finished cooking and they, they pass the bounce test. And then just a layer or two. Don't bury the meat so that you can't taste it. One or two layers of sauce is all it takes. And you just let it kind of bake on. And then if you really want to um, do it right, you lift the lid and you move the ribs over to the hot side with the sauce there. And you sizzle that sauce so that it actually starts to bubble. And that caramelizes the sugars. Most sauces have sugar in them mm -hmm. and it caramelizes and creates more complex flavors. You got to stand right there because it'll burn in a hurry. You know, one or two minutes is all flip um, caramelize or sizzle is, and you're done. And uh, uh, the piece of cake, um, you can just cut them in half and give everybody a half slab. Or if you want, you can cut them in individual bones. If you're going to cut them in individual bones, it helps to flip them over um, the meat side down so you can see the bones better on the back side. Um, that's the basic uh, concept, the basic recipe. I have it all detailed out, you know, step by step uh, on AmazingRibs.com or in my book, Meathead. But um, low and slow, gentle temperatures, and you'll have marvelous ribs. And I expect a report back from you next time I talk to you. <laughs> I, I know, right? Now, uh, one, of, one of the questions I have for you as well is I, I, I have cooked – I've only cooked ribs a couple of times just because – of the challenges I've heard of other people having with them. One of the challenges I've had is whenever I've gone to pick up ribs at the store, I don't necessarily know what to look for. What am I looking for? If I'm, if you're going to make a good rib, you got to start out with a good rib in the first place, right? Yeah. I'll always in all cooking indoors or outdoors, start with quality raw ingredients. You'll end up with a better product. Um, if possible, get fresh, but fresh frozen is not bad. Um, the way they freeze meats nowadays, they're really super fast freezing. Mm -hmm. Um, it makes very tiny ice crystals. If you slow freeze, they make big, sharp ice crystals and that punctures the, um, uh, the muscle fibers and a lot of liquid comes out. And if you've opened frozen foods and seen a lot of liquid in there, um, that's moisture that you can't get back in. So you, um, but nowadays a lot of meats are very fast frozen or Go for fresh. Um, and uh, th there are basically three cuts of ribs. And there's a fourth cut we should talk about. Uh, we'll start with the fourth cut. Uh, the fourth okay. cut is called country ribs. They're not really ribs. They come from the shoulder. And sometimes they may have a rib bone from the very end of the rib cage in there. But they're really shoulder meat. And you, it, they're best treated like pork chops. And pork chops, you want to cook to 140 to 145 degrees. Ribs, you need to cook all the way up to 190 to 205. And that's because of the connective tissues. Right. So right. country ribs, just ignore the fact that they say ribs. They're pork chops, really. Um, so they're not really ribs. Okay. The three major cuts of ribs are baby backs or back ribs mm -hmm. or loin back ribs. And they're the rib section that attaches to the spine. So envision your back. There are rib bones connected to your back. They're hockey um, stick shape. They're curved. And they have um, uh, the most of the meat is on top of the bones. And it's a fairly lean meat. That meat is also the loin meat. So right. when you buy loin chops or pork chops, that's the meat that's on top of the ribs. So the meat that's on top of those ribs is fairly lean and uh, it's, in, it's on top of the bones. As you move, move further down the side of the animal, the side ribs become what's called the spare ribs. And they wrap mm -hmm. around from the side of the animal all the way around to the chest. And spare ribs um, have a, a lot of rib bones in them, but at the end, they have a lot of um, cartilage. And um, if you chop off that cartilage, you have what's called a St. Louis cut. 
<laughs> Sorry about that interruption there. <laughs> um, and the St. Louis cut, um, there's more meat in between the bones than on top of the bones. And it's a little fattier. Um, and uh, you, it, you form your own preference. The St. Louis cut or the spare ribs take a little longer. They take five to six hours to cut um, uh, uh, baby backs, three to four, four hours to cook. So um, th that's the basics right there. Now, it, it, if you cut off the cartilage section, um, that cartilage section is called rib tips. And they're real mm -hmm. popular um, uh, in some sections of the country. Um, uh, there's, they, they're not as neat as eating rib bones. You got to do a lot of gnawing and sucking, <laughs> but uh, uh, it's very, very flavorful. Now, what would you pair alongside of the ribs for the 4th of July? I mean, uh, obviously the potato salad's one of those that yeah, seems yeah. like an I mean, easy you know, one. What, you know, what else do you like? Cornbread, potato salad, uh, coleslaw, you know, I mean, this is, this is the all-American holiday. I mean, 4th of July is our holiday. They don't celebrate it in Europe or Japan. Right. <laughs> it's our holiday. And, you know, uh, they, they do serve a form of potato salad in Europe, but usually it's with olive oil, not with mayonnaise mm -hmm. or or um, sour cream. Um, uh, so usually potato salad, uh, you want to serve German potatoes, uh, uh, potato salad. That's fine, too. It's usually a warm salad, mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, and then. Slaw. Slaw usually comes in two variations, the vinegar, the sweet sour slaw or the mayonnaise slaw. I've got recipes for all of this stuff on AmazingRibs.com <laughs> by if anybody, um, you know, wants a little help. Um, chances are everybody's got grandma's coleslaw recipe in a file card somewhere around the house, uh, you know, uh, and then, you know, watermelon. Um, you know, uh, Juneteenth and Fourth of July are really twin holidays. They're just a couple of weeks apart. And uh, they both celebrate emancipation, if you will. Mm, uh, right. Juneteenth celebrates emancipation of the slaves. Uh, that was the date in which um, the slaves in Texas were informed they were emancipated. Right. Uh, they were actually technically emancipated two years earlier, but they didn't get word until Juneteenth, 1865. Um, and the 4th of July is our emancipation from British occupation. So uh, they're, you know, and the foods are similar. Uh, uh, you know, it's just a wonderful time for gathering with family, cooking outdoors and eating a great meal. I mean, 4th of July and Thanksgiving are the two great food holidays, you know. Now, when when you start talking ribs and I start talking, uh, start thinking about some of the best ribs I've ever had, I start thinking about some soul food and some like collard greens and stuff like that. I mean, do you, what do you have a, a good recipe for for some collard greens for the for the fourth? You know, um, they're very usually just simmered. Um, it, it's not very complex. You. Um, you, you put them in a, uh, in a pot full of water and you cl clean the greens because there's often, you know, little bugs and stuff right. get on them. You want to clean them thoroughly. A lot of people will snap off the stems because they can be a little woody and simmer them rather than boil them. In almost all cooking, whether it's meat or vegetables, high temperatures in general are bad for the food. Now, high temperatures are a good way to brown surfaces. And if you want a brown surface, like on a steak, mm -hmm. then there's a different technique. And we've talked a little bit about steaks and we can do that again another time. But um, in general, vegetables and meats, we, and particularly us guys, we get out there, we turn on the griddle and give it all. <laughs> She's got scuddy. I got four burners. I'm going to crank them all up to high. <laughs> And <laughs> just back off, you know, <laughs> dial it down, dial it down. You'll be a better cook. Now, I, I know I also mentioned before we came on, I had a, a, a question and it kind of goes along with uh, with with grilling and, and doing some ribs. So I had some uh, my, my buddy RJ that he's listened to every interview we've ever done. By the way, oh my goodness, uh, he wanted to know the best ways to season and maintain your grill surface. And he's from uh, from, from upstate New York. Oh, wow. Request. Hey, yeah. I used to live in Ithaca. Oh. And uh, I used to go up to Rochester a lot. So That's I, where he's I from. I love upstate. In fact, I'm going to Ithaca in two weeks uh, to visit with some old 
buddies. My wife used to be an instructor at Cornell and I lectured there often. So beautiful country up there. Gorgeous country. Um, the grill surface. Well, there are many different kinds of grill surfaces. Right. Mm -hmm. um, uh, you, uh, now, typically, they're a grate of some sort um, and uh, or what actually is a gridiron. And that's where the term gridiron for football came from. If you look at a football field, it looks like the gridiron on top of your grill. And what do they play football with? Pigskin. <laughs> <laughs> so there. Um, so you want to look at that gridiron on your grill or the grate. And there are many different kinds. Um, the typical one is steel with a, um, uh, a, a nickel or a chromium or some sort of um, a coating, a, um, uh, and, uh, uh, the, you want the, the key here is you want it as clean as you can, can get. Think, think about a restaurant. Would you eat in a restaurant where they didn't clean the grill surface? <laughs> Not only that, but a clean grill surface is good to keep the food from sticking. Um, ribs aren't going to stick. First of all, they're bow shaped, right. but we're cooking at a low temp. And if you're cooking at a low temp, they don't stick as easily as at a high temp. The real hazard is fish. We can talk about this sometime. Fish sticks to everything. <laughs> um, and and we, there are tricks to getting it, keeping it from sticking. So you want to clean that surface as good as you can. Do not, under penalty of death, bring it inside and put it in your dishwasher. The grease that's on the underside will coat the interior of your dishwasher and you will sleep on the couch for the rest of your life. Um, <laughs> Spoken now, like a man with, with experience. <laughs> I, have, I have experienced this. Um, uh, the, the underside you want clean as well. Uh, a lot of the grease and the fat and the sauces will drip down to the underside and it'll smoke and grease smoke isn't as good tasting as wood smoke. So you want to get the underside clean too. So, the best thing to do is turn on that grill and get that grate really hot, scrub it down good, and then scrub the underside. Now, wire bristle brushes are still my favorite way to do this, but you have to be alert and careful. A lot of wire bristles will come loose, and you do not want to serve a hamburger with a wire bristle hiding on it. I mean, every year there's a story in the press, and it's horrible. Fourth of July, grandma's in the hospital because she ate a hamburger, a hot dog with a wire bristle in there. There are other kind of brushes and scrubbing tools, and we review all of them on, the, on our website. I've tried them all. There's a couple of really good scraping tools. They take a little more time, but um, uh, find one that works for you and just get as much of the grease and carbon It'll often burn uh, down to carbon as you can. Get it off of the surface. Now, the, the, um, the one exception to all this are cast iron surfaces. A lot, cast iron is a popular grill surface. I am not a fan. And I know people who will go out and spend extra money to put down a cast iron surface. And the reason they do is cast iron stores energy and conducts energy really efficiently. And so it makes great grill marks. Mm -hmm. The problem with cast iron is, is it requires care. It requires maintenance, just like a cast iron frying pan. Um, if you just cook on a cast iron grill grate and then serve dinner and go inside and come back in two or three days, it's going to be rusty. Right. And, and then now you're going to really have to scrub. You don't want rust on your food. Um, so um, you, you need to scrape it down after you're done cooking you so everybody's inside eating or you've got the food you've taken it off and you're scrubbing your darn grill off <laughs> and you're putting down a layer of coat to you know a layer of oil to coat it um the other thing about uh, the, the cast iron is they make great grill marks but in between those grill marks the meat is still tan and those grill marks are a chemical reaction called the Maillard reaction. And it's when the amino acids and proteins and the sugars change their chemistry under um, pressure of heat. And um, that browning of the surface is flavor. So ideally, you want the surface all over brown. So I, I am not a fan of grill marks. Now, we are trained when you look at a restaurant menu pictures or frozen foods they always show these beautiful grill marks on them i see that 
and I see wonderful flavor for the grill marks and in between the grill marks, unfulfilled potential. <laughs> you want to brown the entire surface. And the way you do that is by rotating and, and flipping and getting as much of that surface exposed to heat and to the uh, transmission of energy through the grates. So, um, uh, and, and um, don't be using um, oven cleaner chemicals or anything of that sort, um, just elbow grease. Now you, you you see you see the grill marks totally different. Unrecognized potential is what you, I, I love that. That's good. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Now now I know Meathead, you're not the type to uh, to pat yourself on the back or anything, but I did get the notice last week, and I wanted to have the opportunity just to kind of share your thoughts a little bit about being included in the 2021 class of the the barbecue hall of fame i mean meathead what what was that like to get the uh to get the recognition and and to get acknowledgement if you will oh uh, thank you for mentioning it uh, the barbecue hall of fame is in kansas city where else um and uh there are 25 living members about another 15 or 20 who are gone now um and uh this year, five new members were inducted, um, and uh, it's quite an honor. It uh, recognizes the work I've done over many years to teach people how to cook and how to grill and how to enjoy outdoor living. And uh, uh, the other um, uh, inductees this year, uh, it's quite a stellar cast. I don't really belong amongst them, but they include uh, the estimable Arthur Bryant, now gone. But if you know anything about barbecue, Arthur Bryant's in Kansas City is one of the twin pillars of Kansas City barbecue. The other is Gates barbecue. And mm -hmm. also this year, Ollie Gates is being inducted. So I'm sandwiched between our Ollie Gates and Arthur Bryant this year. Um, who, who doesn't belong? <laughs> <laughs> and then Rodney Scott, who is the pillar of barbecue in Charleston, South Carolina, and famous for his expertise with whole hogs. And he's featured uh, on a Netflix special, um, Chef's Table, uh, wonderful video if you wanna go watch it. And uh, Lytle Bridges Cabinus, uh, who is also deceased, uh, one of the rare women who is a, mm -hmm. was a great pit master in Shelby, North Carolina. So it, it, it's, a, it's a pretty special crowd and uh, uh, the list of the other members is uh, I don't belong. <laughs> well, I, I would I would disagree with that that fact, but uh, Mead, hey, congratulations on that, my friend. And and of course, if folks want to find more information on any of the uh, the recipes, the things that we talked about, uh, and anything else, of course, they can uh, they can visit the website as well. I'd be flattered. I'd be honored. Um, there's a good book out there called Meathead: The Science of Great Barbecue and Grilling. Uh, and uh, uh, if you ask questions on AmazingRibs.com, either I or one of my team will be there to help you out. That's right. And uh, and if you want to reply to the podcast here, we will uh, we'll also give you a shout out and uh, and mention your question here uh, the, on our next episode as well. Yeah, send Cameron questions. I like that question about the grill grades. Yeah. So uh, send us an email. It's uh, it's just GQ with Cam at Gmail. Dot com. Well, Meathead, always good to see you, my friend. And again, congratulations on the uh, on the honor and look forward to talking to you next month. Next month, pal. Have a uh, great uh, 4th of July. Before we wrap up things today, someone talked to an interior designer about things you shouldn't have in your home once you're over 30. And here are his top 10. Number one, inflatable furniture. Now, he didn't mention bean bags. Number two, stuffed animals on your bed or anywhere unless you have kids. Number three, plastic cups, plates, and silverware. They say it's time to level up and get something nicer. Number four, old trophies. If you want to display them, your mom would still love to, I'm sure. Number five, a super old mattress. They say 10 years is the max. Number six, dream catchers. Now, a lot of people had them as kids and hung on to them. Number seven, paper floor lamps. 
Now, they're great in college or even in your late 20s, but you need to upgrade when you can. Number eight, anything space-themed, like sheets or blankets with moon and star patterns and those glow-in-the-dark stars that stick on your ceiling, yeah, they should probably go too. Number nine, cork boards. At least not a cheap one if you want your place to look grown up. And number 10, shot glasses as decor. Now you can keep them around to use them, just store them in a cupboard with other glasses. No one cares that you went to Cancun for spring break, well, some 15 years ago. Well, thanks again for joining us for this 95th episode in Season 2 of Good Questions with Cameron Dole. If you ever have a comment, question, anything else you'd like to know, you can hit me up on the contact page at gqwithcam.com. You can also find me on social media on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and TikTok at GQ with Cam. If you'd like to help out in the funding for this podcast, you can visit the merch store where we've got hoodies, shirts, stickers, mugs, tumblers, and more, gqwithcam.com forward slash shop. If you have a special guest idea, email me, gqwithcam at gmail.com. Well, thanks again to our good friend Brandon Allen for coming up with our theme music. We're going to let him play us out and hope you guys have a great rest of your Monday. 